Dr. Rodney Grunding, I'm your host, Dion Abrams, and my usual guest is uh, Brother Takuma Ogunse, and together we will uh, be looking at the current developments in the political sphere here in Guyana. Welcome to the program, Brother Takuma Ogunse. As usual, it's always a pleasure. Mm -hmm. We have been looking at a number of issues over there. Um, uh, we talked last week about the uh, visit of a delegation from the United States as a fact-finding mission, consequently, um, as a consequence of the, the meeting that was held in Washington, um, uh, organized by Rickford Burke and others who are concerned about racial discrimination and other issues here in Guyana. Now that team is currently in the country and uh, they are proposing um, and uh, understanding that they will meet with various stakeholders to garner information. Uh, but a major stakeholder who uh, really uh, the visit surrounds the uh, talks about discrimination and so on. The government, um, they're saying that they're not going to meet with the delegation. Uh, what's, what's the background to that? I, I only heard, I haven't been uh, really, I, I don't have much information on what was said. I was just my wife who said that, you know, told me that. But I don't know if you have any details. Okay, well, before we get there, I would like to use the opportunity on behalf of the program and the Working People's Alliance to say Happy Diwali to our indo guyanese community. This is a very important um, <coughs> festival in the religious calendar of the, the Hindu community. And we want to extend our best wishes and hope that we continue inspiration that we get from this particular festival will continue. So we want to say you know, happy Diwali. Yes, no, I have read the thing from the newspapers. Okay. And the government position is not surprising because from the beginning they have took a hostile position to Mr. Burke and the other Guyanese um, comrades who have been actively okay, raising the question of racial discrimination in the country under the PVP regime. And you know, they went to Washington prior to the Burke Conference to make the case. So the rejection the, or the refusal not to meet this visiting fact finding mission is not surprising. Um, it is consistent with the behavior. And they have said that the reason is, among the reasons they give for not meeting is that their mission came out directly from the activities in the conference and that the, and that the mission is prejudiced to them because it's a mission that is sponsored by Burke. They made a point that they were not involved in establishing the terms of reference for the mission. And on the basis of those and other reasons, they said they would not engage them. So they see the, they, they see the visit as very unwelcome and probably you know, anti-national and, you know, and and that is basically the, the attitude. Um, we in the WPN on this water, the groundings, in the last time we were here, we welcomed them. And we will continue to welcome them. Because we do believe that the question of race and race relations in Guyana, particularly how the government is using the state in a racist and apartheid way to continue and to promote systematically um, racial policies that put the African community and the Amerindian communities 
at a disadvantage is matters that need the attention of all the forces both internally and externally and on the basis that we welcome them. Yeah, but I'm, I'm a bit, uh, I'm wondering at the reasons that were given, how plausible are those reasons. Uh, people have to, if they have a grievance, they have to take it somewhere. They have to raise it at a forum, um, some forum that will give traction to their concerns. Uh, so what is it about uh, the conference that was held by Burke uh, that makes it uh, something that is thrown out the window? Um, the conference initially they said had no merit that it was a failure that they tried to to in every way don't play the significance of the conference something is happening now that suggests that what they were contending is totally not true a delegation is here which is going to present a report to congress and to the congressional black caucus and so on and now they're saying that because it arose out of the conference which they said was basically a waste of time and, and had no uh, kind of, of, of traction in terms of the U.S. government and all of these things, that it was a dismal failure and all of that, uh, that they are now trying to, to say that the conference made something happen. But because the conference made something happen, that they are not going to recognize the delegation. So. What kind of contradiction is that? Well, you, you're quite right, but um, they have treated the conference, the Brock conference, as hostile activity against them. So the attitude that I said is consistent with that because once you, they, they, they took up that position, there is no way that they're going to support okay, anything that comes out of the conference. The important point you make is that while they deem the conference as a failure and not being effective, so they faced him with the reality that the conference was not a failure and that they have to deal with some of the consequences of the conference. And I think that is what is troubling them. You know, that's what is troubling them. You see, it is easy for you to wish away things. You know, rhetoric is always easy. But when the objective reality confronts you is a different story. And what is facing them is a fact-finding mission in Guyana as a result of the conference and a fact finding mission which will in one way or the other help to, <coughs> to, to demonstrate to US interests and I would say the world by extension, you know, how they see things in Guyana and what the findings are. So I think that is worrying with them because the situation in Guyana and the government's behavior is so one-sided that I, I don't think the facts finding mission could come to Guyana without going away, without being convinced that the government is deliberately and willfully okay, tilting the scale okay, in a particular direction. But the question of the terms of reference, how logical is that argument in relation to what happens in Guyana? Now you want to dictate and determine the terms of reference for people coming from another country, you know, um, who are coming to investigate the situation here. You have issues in your own country, the Amerindians were complaining that they had no influence over the terms of reference for the, the Madia school uh, massacre, that fire. People are complaining about not having terms of any uh, knowledge of the terms of reference for every other thing that, every other inquiry, they, they, um, the last, apart from that was, what was the last inquiry, it's slipping me, right? But we always have an issue with the government about them making, you know, drawing up terms of reference and not consulting. The other thing is that 
uh, the recent case of the 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 uh, fiasco with the contracts given to the company for 800 and something million dollars, two con three contracts that they collapsed into one when the bid went out for only one. And now the request for the documents and, and so that the people can track how that contract was given, the decision so, and so on, it's not being handed over. So what track record do they have? of transparency and, and all of these things that they may want to raise in relation to their own actions here in Guyana and wanting to dictate a, a, a supposedly a neutral uh, entity coming to investigate what is happening here. Well, the government um, claimed that they have got a chance to participate in the terms of reference. It's very contradictory. You can't start by rejecting the process and expect you to participate in the process that you reject. They start by rejecting the process. They reject the process. So if you reject the process, how oh, at the same time you will want to participate in terms of reference. So to me, that's a way that that's so contradictory and so idiotic. You know, because that is their position. From day one, they reject the conference. They reject anything that comes out of the conference. They reject the mission. So if you reject all of that, where is the basis? Um, participation in framing the terms of reference. You only can participate in framing the terms of reference if you give recognition to the activity and you express an interest to participate. You know, so that is totally nonsense. And they don't have no record, as you pointed out, in their own dealings with their own citizens, okay, to allow people to participate in shaping terms of reference. But in this particular case, it's, it's nonsense. They should be ashamed to make the argument. It's just not logical. It makes sense. Yeah, well, you see, they have this way of, of you know, always coming up with, with schemes to defend whatever they do, uh, even though it, many times they are aware that what they say hold no water. Um, but uh, the folks are here. Uh, do you think that uh, the African community and the Amerindian community are organized enough uh, with you know, the kinds of information to present to these uh, investigators that would substantiate in a, you know, a, a defined way uh, the contentions that they have? Um, I can only say I hope that um, the African community is prepared and that the various organizations and representatives are prepared. Um, I can't make a, a, a full and final judgment because I'm not in contact with all of the various forces. But I would say, given what I know about the, the, the community on this matter, they will be in a position to make an effective case. Yeah, they will be in a position to make an effective case. Yeah, but uh, for, uh, I mean, raised it because you know it, it's no, it's key. Uh, yeah, that is key. it's key to you know, if we're making an argument, you got to, you got to be able to substantiate it, evidence, and, and evidence and right documentation, and, yeah. and so on. I noticed that the the World Bank is calling for disaggregated information in relation to how governments deal with uh, you know the the populace. They want figures on how different segments of the society are treated in terms of what the government does. Yeah. How will our government fare? We have been calling for that. Um, I know uh, Dr. Um, former Minister of Labor with the PPP. Henry Jeffrey. Henry Jeffrey <laughs> has been, you and, know. And, and Nigel. And Nigel Hughes. Nigel Hughes. They I think been. the government will dodge it as, much, as long as they could dodge it, but I think eventually Collective um, pressures will be brought to bear, but I think that they are not going to embrace it because to embrace it is to expose themselves. And so they will do as much as they could do to delay it, but to the extent that it becomes part of the international um, framework in these in international institutions, that in itself puts some pressures from government. You know, they will please we, they have to please you know, these national people.
Um, but they will, they, will, they will try their best to delay that as long as possible because that is self convicting. Well, let's see what kinds of pressures can be put to bear um, so that they can. The truth can really come out because Jack Dio's primary uh, shout out is provide the evidence. But when the evidence does come, in whatever small way it does, then he goes in a circle and tries to, you know, downplay that evidence that is brought forward. But a lot of the evidence that he has called for the government has, and the government has a responsibility on to any proper government who is serious about these things, would not allow itself to be forced to provide evidence. They don't volunteer the evidence to dispute, mm -hmm. you know, the, yeah. the, the claims of the critics. That asks the, asks the victims to provide the evidence. When the evidence has to come from, from the state. <laughs> come from the state. And then Henry Jeffrey have been very strong on yeah, making that point. Right, right, you know? right. Yeah. But they're they not going to... So they're just, they're just playing games. <laughs> yeah, it's a real kind of <laughs> tragedy. Now, the, the Venezuelan issue, uh, first of all, how do you see... Uh, the, it's a contentious issue, it seems, uh, that Venezuelans are coming here because of a crisis in their own society. What are your thoughts on the fact that they are coming to Guyana? Not only Guyana, but Trinidad has had its fair share of, of troubles with them and other countries, uh, neighboring countries, uh, bordering countries like Colombia and so on. But what are your thoughts of, about Venezuelans coming to Guyana in relation to the current? No, I think that um, it is established international, um, well-established standards, and Guyana is signatory to international conventions on the question of migration and, and, and people who are fleeing the countries for, you know, because of economic and maybe political um, instability. Uh, instability, disasters, and so on. So Guyana, as a civilized country, has to accommodate some of that. But in terms of, the, the, of Venezuela, we have to recognize that we are, we are not just a neighbor in Venezuela. We are, we are a country where Venezuela is claiming three third, you know, a, 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 a country, a huge part of your country, which complicates how Guyana should or deal with that inflow of um, migrants from Venezuela. Um, I think that under any circumstances, when you have a huge country like Venezuela in terms of population, where it's millions, a new population, about 700 or something thousand, that you under tremendous, when that number okay, of persons are coming over your border, whatever the reason, it puts you under tremendous pressure because your population against their inflow puts you in a very awkward position both economically to deal with them and more so since there is a country that laying claims to their border and they are coming in and occupying space within the, dis the, the, the territory that they claim. I don't want to dispute the territory because they're not disputing the territory that belongs to Guyana. You know, complicates the equation. And I think that Guyana have, you know, reached a point where we have to draw the, the, draw the line in the sand on this matter. And we have to stop the inflow of Venezuelans into our country. We have already in my judgment, we have already, over the years, honor our obligation to our international treaties by allowing the significant numbers of Venezuelans, you know, who are economic migrants and so, to, to, to come to the country. But in the light of the, 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 the recent hostility and the, the, the unprecedented move by the Venezuelan government to, 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 to have a referendum, which is asking the citizens, okay, to support the claim of, of, of a secret book, create a new situation and 
coinciding with this new Venezuelan aggression is a larger inflow of Venezuelans, which raised the question whether this new inflow qualifies as economic migrants or whether they are not deliberately manipulated by the political authorities in Venezuela to begin to reoccupy Esiklubo so that over time they will have a basis to make a claim the Guyanese government is mistreating Venezuelan citizens in the area and give them a justification, you know, you know, to send in the army. So I'm saying that the situation has reached a point, and in light of the recent aggression by Venezuelan government, which has upped the antique and have made an unprecedented move to have a referendum to get the citizens to approve the seizure of Esequibo then we have to stop, the, 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 the Guyanese state has to stop the inflow of Venezuelan migrants in the country because we can't determine who is the legitimate economic migrants and who are there as part of the political you know, <coughs> machinations of the Venezuelan state. And I'm saying we have already honor our obligation by international treaty and this time that we put a halt to it. But the government, uh, I, I quite understand, because Guyana has been a part of uh, migration to other states. We still have lots of Guyanese in Antigua, in Trinidad, in Barbados and so on. So we have had, and even to Venezuela, uh, lots of Guyanese went to Venezuela. I know some of them have come back. Uh, are Guyanese, actually Guyanese, who, because of the current situation, came back with their families and so on. Uh, but your concerns are legitimate. The country's concerns are legitimate. Um, uh, Rear Admiral Best uh, highlighted in a very, you know, clear way the concerns that we should have. But the government seems to have another position. Uh, which basically is aligned with their future um, plans for staying in power. How patriotic is that position being taken by Jack View? First of all, I uh, saying that the Venezuelans will be given ID cards and they will be allowed to vote uh, on the second part. Uh, how how? patriotic is that and then he also had said that you know we can negotiate with Venezuela to give them a path uh, to the Atlantic and all of that he seems to in some way in his mind uh, want to play with the the, the entire uh, scope and boundary of the country both in terms of the political sense and the geog geographical sense. So how, how do we deal with that? Well, um, I think we have dealt with the, the, the PPP's um, approach to trying to, they, they've been building up an electoral rigging strategy to compensate, the last program we did, to compensate for the outflow Okay. Of a lot of Indian Guyanese, um, the, the, the supporters are potential supporters, and they deliberately have been encouraging, you know, foreign people, both Venezuelans and, and others, to come into the country with the hope that they would be given the right to vote in the country, and hopefully they will vote for the PPP and ensure that the PPP um, is returned to office. Now you ask how patriotic or how unpatriotic it is. I mean, it is very unpatriotic when a government in our circumstances is prepared to play that kind of game with a neighboring country that have an active border dispute with you. You know, and I think that the Venezuelans have been taking advantage of that. You know, you want to play the game, let me play the game. You want to encourage Venezuelans and so, 
okay, they're coming to Guyana and to help keep me in power. Okay, let me play the game. We're going to use it to make sure we send in so much Venezuelans that they will satisfy our objective to make it a strength and claim for So it's totally unpatriotic, it is dangerous politics. It is dangerous politics. And I, 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 I can't see nothing patriotic about that. It is not politics in, in, in a normal situation where you're then dealing with a, a large and hostile uh, um, neighbor claiming a significant part of your territory. You know. So for me, it's very unpatriotic. Um, the, the Jagdio, um, I mean, um, Vincent had raised it and, and give some new information on Politics 101, Dr. David mm -hmm. Hines' program we, a few days. Um, was on that program myself on Vincent. And he did raise the question that, um, in fact, Jadio and Maduro, because he said Maduro at the time was a foreign minister, mm -hmm. you know, under the um, Chavez government, and he had visited Guyana. And they, in fact, struck a deal based upon giving Venezuela access to the Atlantic. And that um, the thing was only spoiled when it was leaked in Venezuela before they were able to consolidate the agreement and the Chavez government had to back away. And he said that he was well informed, he was reliably informed, you know, on one of his visits to Venezuela as part of an election observing team. He was told about the, the matter from a high level Venezuelan um, authority. So the matter of gone, yeah, you know, but I want to add, which I didn't get a chance to add on the David's program, that the idea of giving Venezuela an access to the Atlantic as part of some agreement yeah. does not originate with Jack David or Maduro or Chavez. It was something that was thrown in the political in, 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 the, in, the, in the water equation long before any of them had um, come to political prominency. So it's not no grand idea from Jack D. Okay. Uh, right? That's the one they've been waiting about to make. Whatever merit or dismerit is in the, the approach, they don't come to Jack D. He's just adopting it. Okay? So I think that for the historic record, um, it's important to make that fact. I can't remember exactly um, this, you know, who or which organization or agency was responsible for putting it forward. But I know for a fact it was one of the con possible considerations that was thrown into the equation. But doesn't Venezuela have access to the Atlantic? Well, I, I, really, I, I can't tell you out of my head, the job of but apparently <laughs> that, a section, that section uh, 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 that they must want to develop, yeah, don't, don't, don't have yeah, access. Are, because, you know, they have this, uh, disputes, territorial uh, disputes with Trinidad, Caribbean. and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, even Colombia and all of the other places. So, and those are not disputes over land. It's over water, right? And if they didn't have access to the Atlantic, they wouldn't have oil rigs in the Atlantic, and so on. So, um, but I guess the persons who must propose it must propose it in the light. It's something that could avoid a bigger disaster. But I, that's something, you know, we have to, have to, have to be careful. You see, the problem that we will have with, with, with any agreement with Venezuela, it is not two states that have comparable strengths, both in numbers and military. So whatever agreement you sign with Venezuela, you are going to have no way of, of ensuring or controlling yeah. Venezuela on it. Because on it today, and it changes a new government where you will do tomorrow, change it. You know, so whatever we do, we can we can't act based upon any simple good faith of a Venezuelan government. We have to act and to hope that 
we have the, the international law behind our, ourselves and international mor um, morality and solidarity because only that will guarantee us whatever happened on the border to make Venezuela you know, behave in a civil way. We have, we by ourselves can't reinforce that. So I will be very careful of entertaining any solution that's outside the international solution in the matter is at the at the award court. And uh, now we wait for us to, to, to get that uh, the verdict, you know. But, but, but the open access that the PPP is giving to Venezuelans, they have with no required notations, you give them uh, get visas and so on. They uh, sought to prevent people from the African continent coming here. Uh, what is the difference between the Haitians, the Africans, and the Venezuelans? Race. <laughs> <laughs> the Haitians, the Africans, the Africans, the Africans, the Africans, and then they see that as simple logic. If you encourage that, it, it, it helps the African numbers. Okay. And, and if you encourage that, if they give, if they win the voting rights, they're likely to follow the, the kind of vote against the PVP. Uh, the other people, they feel they're more likely to vote in the direction. So it's clear race. Those are racial considerations. So, uh, that's another part of the tendency of the government to dis discriminate against Africans. Right? Not only Africans who are born, Indiana, but Africans in general. generally. Mm -hmm. they, see, they see any inflow of Africans wherever they come from as a threat to them because they see it will enhance in their mind African numbers and by extension African politics and so forth and so forth. So they have a hostility, a built in hostility to that. But shouldn't we be campaigning for a change in yeah. that? Yeah, that we should, should be campaigning. If the Venezuelans are. Yeah, 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 we should be campaigning for change, but. Um, you know, sometimes you have to direct your energies, you know, they're more strategic, you know, and don't get caught up a bit, you know, just reacting to what the new uh, uh, um, is doing. I think that what is important for us as an African Guyanese community is to try to rekin our people's loyalty to the country and to the border issue. And um, to me, that, that is something that we have more under our control than to get, in, than to get the PPP to change its attitude to the, to the diaspora Africans coming in, into Guyana. You know? But you're trying to, you made a good point because as a child growing up, under Forbes born, the Venezuelan issue was pretty prominent. But somehow, I, as a child, I had a feeling that the entire country was so motivated, you know, against Venezuela that everywhere you turn, you heard not a blade of grass, you heard, you know, Guyanese, we own you. But I don't get that kind of feeling, what is the difference between the PPP government and Burnham, whom we labeled as a dictator, as this and that, they tried to bastardize in every way. Um, what could have motivated people to that level at that time, as against now where people are simply seeming not to care? Um, okay. I mean, we don't want to, to the, the, the program to deal with such a large chunk of the program mm -hmm. to the, the, these matters if I may not get to the other matters. Um, it is true that in the, in the time of Burnham, you know, we had more solidarity on the border issue. But we shouldn't fool ourselves, it was a perfect solidarity. I think the African community have always been more involved in seeing the territorial integrity of the country as something that they, has, they, have, to, they have to defend. I think in the Indian community, they have always been okay 
a reluctance or they, they, they haven't they, they have never supported it to the extent that the African community supported it. People will are in part people will argue the reflection of the internal politics because Burnham was the person you know who who government uh, African led government and to the extent that their party was not in, in, in government you know they, they, they took a little standoff position but relative to what the situation is now I think we generally had across the board um, more um, unity and a more genuine um, commitment to defense in the country and the war and, and, and the war um, I, I think that um, it is not far-fetched to say that the internal problems with governance in this country has created a situation where we have to do quite a lot, you know, to get Guyanese across the board to be as committed as in the early days on, on this matter. Um, you know, it's, it's going to be a it's going to be it's going to be it's going to be a hard fight, a ding dong fight. We just got to hope, you know, because um, the concern, you know, about I mean, who is going to fight um, is a legitimate one, considering the composition of the army and so on, uh, and the nature of the PPP. A contradiction exists in itself there, whether people and uh, the Africans who are part of the armed forces in the main are going to be so feel so uh, because people associate government with you know some level of patriotism that is and we don't know you know because I've listened to they want send me at the border for fight to defend them God they see the wealth and everything in the country as going in one direction and the fight to defend that as a fight to defend uh, that which is going to Jack Dio and his, his click and his elite, so. Uh, but that patriotism has to be more profound for all of us because we're talking about our territory, our country, which we do not want to give up. All right, so. Well, people are telling me, I mean, I don't watch the government program as much as they probably ought to watch. Somebody and was telling me that um, now, you know, in the past, especially so let, me, let me take the, the recent past, like from the NP to return to power. Mm -hmm. They are totally blocked out opposition persons from government programs, yeah. programs and so on. But people are saying now you're seeing a few government uh, opposition faces on the, uh, on the, on the program. I am not know if I don't know. pay attention, but so like, they make a little concession, uh, uh, you know, on, uh, on that in terms of border issues. But, um, when we get to other issues, I will also need a connection. Because I think, you know, we have to really deal with this problem in a very comprehensive way. We can't play games with it, or else we're not going to give the necessary solidarity. Mm -hmm. Well, other problems, $25,000, teachers, and, and some increase, across the board increase, for all public servants. Uh, this, these, these bonuses that they give, I mean, part of a, a continued process of giving people a little handout here and a handout there, you know, $25,000 in the context of our economy, um, how does that factor in the equation uh, of current Crisis on the market and all of these things, as against a living wage, a livable wage. No, no, I think I think as I pass, man. Mm -hmm. as I pass, I mean, you know, as I pass, I mean, look, if Ghana was a different place, when they announced that that pittance, the two hundred five thousand dollar pittance is bonus, okay, in the context of their kind of all wealt, thousands of Ghanaians should have hit the streets and let them know that they shit. You know, the, the wealth in this country belongs to the people. And the people have a right to participate in determined priorities. And I'm telling you, Guyanese, we give a higher priority 
to the social and economic situation you know that the government is giving the government is really taking advantage of the weakness of the population the the, 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 the fact that we're not a cohesive um, country on these matters and that to the extent that they got unions fighting they, they're not fighting beyond rhetoric they're not in a capacity in a position to bring people out to close the place down and so forth and so forth so the government is is playing on that weakness and suspending dealing with Guyanese poverty okay in a in a meaningful way when there has the means to do it you know and, 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 and that is political criminal behavior because you're punishing thousands and thousands of ordinary citizens for a protracted period that can't be justified you know and I think that they're lucky that they, they, they got to deal with the population deal because in some some places the ruling politicians would have done the run you can't do that in the context of the kind of plenty we have now and in terms of um the continuation of the government to try to destroy the unions because this is what they're doing when a government decides it is not going to act on collective bargaining arrangements with the workers the organized workers who have struggled for years and won that right is constitutional and legal right both locally and even and internationally and the government has deliberately and consistently denying the workers leadership from engaging in a process to determine the value of workers labor power okay and they have been imposing salaries and wages increase on the workers okay that is a declaration of war against working people and this has been continued systematically for the greater part of the people if um forced um 23 years in office of 92 okay to win the last the elections to the apmu afc and now they, they, they came back into power they continuing continuing the, the, that policy but as i said i want to make the linkage because you can't defend the, you can't on the one hand tell me that the border issue is important and you are you asking the nation to coerce you know around the government okay in the and the nation on the border issue and you the government is continue to relentlessly pursue the hostility the important you know um, section of the community an important stakeholder the trade unions and their membership are important and critical stakeholders in the country no country could have any significant defense against foreign aggression whatever form it take whether it take military or non-military if you don't have the support of organized labor and any serious government would have recognized the need in the context of this Venezuelan aggression to make peace with organized labor and rather than to to continue its aggression and announce, you know, that you 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 announce across the board um, increases, which you know the workers and the leaders have been fighting against, is a continuation of hostility in the context of on the one hand you asking the country, the people, okay, to unite against Venezuela and unite around the border. And you the government who have seized the people's resources, have engaged in hostile activity against the working people, doesn't see the importance of making a concession to the people by saying, look, we are now entering into a new phase and we have to do things better and we have to begin to respect the rights of our people. We have to begin to make them feel as the meaningful stakeholders in the governance process and seen as having rewards okay out of the the, 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 the oil revenue and the and, and the revenue that the government gets from all the economic activities as an important ingredient okay to solidify 
cohesion around defense in the territory. You have to make that just like how they've made a, a compromise with the political opposition by saying, look, we can talk, don't worry, we come off the high horse. We talk, the more thing is important, we will talk, which is good. And as I told you, the opposition now is having more access to government, uh, media, and people are hearing the opposition things that they didn't hear for the last two years. That in political terms is a concession to the opposition, recognizing the importance and the seriousness of the war. To the extent that that is true, it is good. But I'm going further. I'm saying the government has to end its hostility against organized labor and make a political concession to the trade unions and the working people of this country by accepting the right to collective bargaining and stop the bullyism. And it is important for the cohesion of the country and to get people to be committed to, 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 to the sovereignty of the country. I can't see the, the separation that any serious government who is seeing the border issue as an important um, matter for the country will recognize that you have to give priority to that issue. And you have to change in a real way, okay, the way you behave and how you move the various sections of your population, you know, to be more committed to the country. Look, if, if, if you're given uh, $25,000 as a year-end bonus, uh, you're saying it's an embarrassment and it's disrespectful to the citizenry, to the public servants and so on. What are your expectations in relation to the announcement that in the uh, air finale said he would make in relation to salaries? It's probably going to be pittance. And I, 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 I really, as I, I, I've been saying, that is a continuation of the war against our working people. It shouldn't happen. It shouldn't happen in the context of, of, of what we're facing. This government has to make a U-turn on some of these matters. And to the extent that they refuse to make a U-turn and continue with hostility against the work, uh, such a major part of the, uh, of, of the society, it's reckless political behavior. He's not going to announce anything of significance to, to, to the workers. If he had any goodwill, he would, have, he, would have, he would not have done what he, he, he did and announced his intention. And it's not too late for him to, 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 to if, he was a, if he was a proper government, and if he, he had he was the calling the shots, I don't know he called the shots, I didn't do calling the shots. But if he and the PPP really you know, want to be taken seriously, in the light of the criticism, the observation I made, they should back off on that and calling the workers and leadership and say, look, let me find common ground in the context of everything that we will be facing you know, in the coming months uh, you, you know, in the country. And I doubt they're going to do it. But I decided to put them on, on, on the line. Well, well, you mentioned that people seem not to want to fight in their own interest, that, you know, the unions are... Recently, there was some kind of strike fall by the Guyana Teachers Union. Uh, the, the union seems to be saying that it was somewhat effective, uh, but it wasn't a protracted strike. I know that a meeting was called uh, subsequent to the action. Uh, I thought that meeting would have been to galvanize the workers to have a more deeper engagement with the government. Uh, but uh, if I'm right, the government, possibly because they wanted to to defray, uh, to you know, not have uh, that strike as effective as it should have been. I, I don't. I think they called in the union as they would normally do to pretend that they have an interest in moving forward. Um, but how long do we expect this game to continue? We're not hearing anything from the PSU and, and so on, the, the other unions that are representing the other public servants. But um, how long are people going to sit back 
and allow this money that is coming in that belongs to them to be under the control of, of these people who are using it merely to advance their own cause and their own interests and their, to be basically self-serving. What is going to break the camel's back? My, if, I, if I knew how to tell you, mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, you see, I, I want to be very careful because in an environment, I know, I mean, I've been around politics long enough to know there's a, there's a political culture in this place among uh, keeping the remarks to trade union leaders. Now, it is established that politicians are supposed to be telling trade unions how they run the business. Okay? But in the history of Guyanese political struggle, trade unions and politicians and political parties and trade unions and politics have had a very close alliance. And in fact, most of the political parties come out of trade unions and so forth. But we have reached a point where, you know, it is established that, look, trade unions should be given their own independent space, make the decisions and so forth. So as a political person, I, 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 I want to be careful, I don't want them to say I try to dictate to them you know, what they, they ought to do, and I ain't got no basis to doing it. You know? I, I will say I got a basis because I've always been in solidarity with working people and their struggles, and I think that as a political person, you want to extend that solidarity to even to a point to get a little advice. But I mean, you have to be careful that you don't push to a point where it becomes counterproductive. But I I know all the difficulties that trade union leaders argue that make it difficult for them to engage in strikes as they used to do many years ago. And I don't want to I don't want to have the last word on that. But I I am very concerned why there's one thing to, to, to have activities in the space of work, close down your workplace. But if you can't do that effectively, you could keep massive rallies outside the, in the wider community, okay, demonstrating your, 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 your solidarity and bringing pressure on the state. So if we say for some reason, and we're running, I guess we are under pressure time. Yeah, yeah. yeah uh, for some reason, we, are, we can't pull off strikes in the way we used to the old way. I don't see why collectively they can't organize to have massive rallies of the, 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 the if they say they want demonstrations on the road, say you want march because whatever reason you're frightened, you're frightened penetration, you're frightened, whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, you just got all kinds of excuses. But I don't think you can make an excuse to have a massive rally of, you know, unions, you know, come in and express their, their concerns you know, in a public space, that they're not doing. And I, I can't understand. They have to find ways to, to up the pressure on the government and to be able to, because you see this thing is a two-way thing. If your membership, if you could find ways to make your membership feel that you're doing something, it bear more fruits. More and more workers will be more confident that you know we, we're getting somewhere and it, it will have a kind of multipliable effect but if you don't do that you got the opposite effect it disorganize your people and continue to disorganize it so i'm saying you know minimum man they must organize some massive demonstration if you don't want to go down the road marching and so at, at, at ground at a common spot somewhere bring thousands out Okay, and the demands of the pressure the government. Well, let's hope, you know, that something will be done uh, because I'm not of any expectation in relation to the announcement that Ali is going to make. I mean, if it's uh, an announcement of uh, the government has to announce 800 and something million dollars to go to a certain section of the society, they're going to do that pretty confidently and how clouded it is, but when it comes to the, the life and livelihood of the ordinary man, who, by the way, are the, 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 the I mean, governments can't function without these people whom they're treating as non-entities, non-entities, you know what I mean? 
uh, it's really sad because the government machinery, everything that happens, yeah, they, they have to work with those public servants, education and, and everything, you know. But it's uh, tragic and um, very hopeful uh, that something can be done to change the trajectory in our country. Uh, I want to thank you all for being with us and we look forward to being with you, Brother Owen. Thank you for being again with us on this program. Do have a good night to the viewers out there. See you next week, same time, same channel, for another program of Walter Rodney Grumman's. Good night.